We started to hear a little bit about Mohair. We have Mohair South Africa here as well. But we're shining the light on Frances, who is a designer and an entrepreneur. She focuses on Mohair textiles. She collaborates with a team of women artisans in rural communities, weaving a story about the origins of textiles, but also at the same time, allowing for the natural environment to inform every aspect of their design and making process. She was raised on a mohair farm in the Karoo Desert and she has a deep affinity for this natural fiber. And she spent the last several years developing a business designed to elevate mohair to a more prominent status as one of the world's most ancient and exclusive fibers. Her role in creating an inclusive, sustainable supply chain, specifically adapted ecosystem of the South African textile industry earned her a Mandela Washington Fellowship. Yes, we can click for her. And like Asetua, she's also studied political science, philosophy <laughs> and economics, but she studied at the University of Stellenbosch and has a postgraduate degree in international relations from UCT. Her work for Kate Otten Architects Threads is also currently on show at the 2023 Venice Biennale. I always say that name wrong as well. No, it's perfect. <laughs> Yay! Well, we're really excited to have Francis with us and kick off our three presentations. Please note we will be keeping questions and answers to the lunch break potentially just depending on how we go with timing so not um, note your questions down make notes so you can engage with Francis and our following speakers um, in the in-between over to you Francis thank you so much thank you so it's a really huge privilege to speak to you today and thank you so much to Jackie and the entire twig team for the invitation and I really hope that our story of a very tiny studio in the Karoo can resonate in some way with you today. Um, just briefly, I am just checking if it's okay. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm an entrepreneur focusing specifically on developing mohair textiles in South Africa. For us, every step of the process is handmade by phenomenal women artisans in remote areas of the country. And steeped in sustainable practices, what we try and do is really to preserve and celebrate traditional craftsmanship in these communities. Before we start at all, I think it's really important for us to know what mohair is. So, mohair, see if it comes up. I don't know if I'm clicking in the right place. Should I click towards you guys? Oh, here we go. Um, mohair is the fleece of an Angora goat. So, every six months, this goat gets a haircut, it's a sharing, and the hair of the goat is called mohair. What is really important is often Angora goats and Angora rabbits get confused. And for textiles, it's very important that you know that there's no link between the two. The one is a goat, the one is a rabbit. They just share this name because they both originate from an area of Turkey called Ankara, which used to be known as Angora. But mohair is really one of the world's most exclusive, sustainable, and niche natural fibers. In the textile world, it's largely called a diamond fiber because the supply of it is so small and it has some phenomenal characteristics. I'll just share some with you today. It's got this beautiful natural luster which gives finished fabrics this beautiful luxe and silky look and feel. It's light and crease resistant and yet it's incredibly strong and delicate. It's also a fantastic ingredient fiber in that it blends beautifully with other animal and plant-based fibers when you're making a yarn. So mohair alpaca, mohair cashmere, mohair linens. Um, and then very much in the textile world, it's celebrated for its dyeability. Because it's got this natural luster and character, it really absorbs and showcases color fantastically. 
What very few people know, and it was touched on earlier um, with Dion in the panel discussion, is that up to 60% of the world's mohair is produced in South Africa, specifically in the Karoo area, which is... That is also where we have our studio. What is even more interesting, oh, I have my voice back. What is even more interesting is that the supply of mohair is so small in the world that it hasn't been economically interesting for anyone else to develop a processing plant outside of those that already exist in South Africa. So as a result, almost all of the world's raw material of mohair from Texas or Australia, comes to South Africa to be processed. So we become this nucleus of the global production and processing of mohair. That said, and we touched on this in the panel discussion, up to 70% of the world's mohair supply leaves this country in a very raw form, with little being done locally to beneficiate this raw material and to build our own textile industry. So in this image, the the first, what, this is raw, what raw mohair looks like, and the second image is what processed mohair. That's before it gets spun into a yarn. And I just feel if we're going to be recognized as the home of mohair the world over, we have to start producing excellent end products locally. Not only to talk about the phenomenal characteristics, but also this really unique African heritage. And it was with this in mind that we started our brand. I think, and this is the perfect kind of talk to have this, it's important to spend some time to stop and talk about the producers. I think it's really important and valuable to understand where the source of our fabrics come from, but it's reached a point where we need to, as designers or end users, just go one step further and really start understanding what are the nuances and challenges and really the beauty involved in farming our threads. Um, what has been fantastic to see in the mohair industry in South Africa is that there's been an understanding that we're living in a rapidly changing world and this commitment to continuous growth. And this can mainly be seen in the impact that farming has on the environment. Mohair farmers in South Africa have been practicing regenerative farming long before it's the current catchphrase. Everyone's talking about regenerative farming, but really it's the only way to actually sustain and farm in the, these Karoo conditions or in what has been the most unimaginable drought that we've experienced. It just makes sense. The healthier, the happier your animal is, the longer it lives, the better quality the mohair. If you're, if you're farming in an area where it's a semi-desert plant life, you have to make sure that you sustain the land and the plants, otherwise the regrowth takes so long it's impossible to continue. Um, what is also fantastic is that being a small niche industry with only under 1,000 farmers in South Africa, which is really small for a fiber industry, offers this amazing opportunity for people to communicate really quickly and impact change very rapidly. And as was touched on about the Responsible Mohair Standards, or RMS, almost all South African mohair farmers are now certified, which is this global certification ensuring the ethical and sustainable production of mohair. And as a raw materials country, this has really been an invaluable tool for us to connect with a bigger global value chain and really to be part of very forward thinking and encouraging collaborations. And I think we can all agree that we are at a point in history where we can no longer make without preserving the land, 
the environment and the communities from which our resources stem. So to give you just a brief background, I think most of you know this, of South Africa's textile landscape. Unfortunately, we are a country with high poverty and unemployment rate and a relatively crippled formal textile sector, which has left many people frustrated and unable to use their skill to, to make a living. What we have done is really to focus on what are the strengths and the overlooked skills specific to the socioeconomic and environmental makeup of South Africa's textile industry. What do we have? We've got the best mohair in the world, produced under the most sustainable practices. We've got some of the only processing houses of mohair in the world. And even though we don't have a formal, highly te technical textile sector, we've got thousands of phenomenal traditional artisans. And when you combine all this with excellent quality and design, you find that you can produce a product that can hold its own on any world stage. And in a time where we have said the biggest trend is transparency and openness, and you can ask any designer, this is great and we think we need it, but what, how do you protect yourself from everyone seeing absolutely every small, beautiful detail of what you do? And we found ourselves in a very privileged position in that what we do is so specific to the environment and the skill set that we have here that it becomes almost impossible to authentically imitate that anywhere else. And this is really something that I, a concept that I couldn't drive home more. I worked in the ta textile industry in Hong Kong and did beautiful residencies in Japan and Italy finding out what we could do with mohair. I was so frustrated and I think I, it's shared maybe in this room, about what I thought I needed to make or how and what the world needed to see from mohair, but we didn't have any of that technical ability in South Africa. And it was only until I stopped fighting what we don't have that suddenly everything became really small, very simple, new, and actually meaningful. And I really think figuring out ways around what doesn't exist is so much more interesting than that what does. And I think the impact and power that you have when you create within the ecological and social footprint that makes sense to you results in even the tiniest bit of output becoming outstanding. And it captures the imagination and attention for people out there looking for moments of authenticity, storytelling, and truth. Um, so this concept of farm to fabric is very much woven into my being. I had the great privilege of growing up on a family farm in the Karoo. And being a little girl, growing up in this uh, desert town, and always being enchanted by fashion and textiles, I wanted nothing more to escape into everything cities to experience this. And my dad used to chuckle and take me into the felt with him and explain to me, if I wanted to understand where fashion and fabrics came from, I needed to spend more time with nature, the starting point from which the rest follows. And at the time I thought, oh, you poor delusional man, you don't know anything. <laughs> um, but this really became the primary principle from which we create, in that we feel strongly that circular, sustainable textile economies in no way start in our studio or in factories. For us in the way we make, the process starts with rainfall, with the delicate ecosystem of the desert plant life, the role of herdsmen, the quality of ground, the importance of having healthy, happy animals in order to produce quality mohair. And only then when you have the raw material do you move into the process of washing it, cleaning it, spinning it, until finally that yarn ends up on the loom. So in many ways, weaving and finishing 
is the last few steps of a very intricate and codependent supply chain. So once we see this connection between us and nature and all the skill and actor need to get from farm to fabric, you make differently, you think differently, you certainly don't need more and more, and you become very selective and respectful as to the timelessness of that piece. And for me, it turns a really simple textile into an invaluable homemaker, passed down from one generation to the next, who build their own homes and they weave their own memories into these threads. So knowing where the roots of our fibers come from, I feel a strong responsibility to complete the final steps in a similar way. So for us, our end product is as important as the process and the makeup. Taking our design inspiration from the Karoo, where nature is the defining element, it informs every aspect of what we try to create. So nature's effortless tactility, coloring, composition, remains our greatest teacher with the most valuable lesson and often the one most challenging to achieve being that of simplicity. So for me personally, the Karoo strips you back to what I would call the mesmerizingly simple with nothing to distract you noticing the light, the scorch of a midday sun, the slow relief of an evening breeze and the impossible quest of a dung beetle pushing life shit into a treasured ball of soul-defining importance. But it humbles, it makes you feel tiny in its antiquity, and yet it generously offers up this blank canvas in which you can translate what you feel into shapes and stories that only you can imagine. And this feeling of being a tiny speck in space is then matched with this enormous sense of privilege and bigness in that you know you are the only person in the world who has noticed a tiny pop of purple in a passing desert plant. And then you look again and the light has changed and the plant has closed and everything's kind of returned to a nothing to see here dull. It's a moment that's so small but humbling and what I would call mesmerizing in its simplicity. So in our studio, we really try to prioritize time to play with shapes, with color and stitch lines. And through our fabrics, we try to capture a little bit of this place, its people, the history, and our own personal relationships with tortoises and mountain folds. I think you guys are blocking my trigger. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Um, what is very interesting is that the Karoo is home to mohair the world over, and that the fiber actually reflects the characteristics of the landscape. So it's soft, it's, it changes quickly, it absorbs light and color beautifully. And so for us in our work to celebrate the land, the fiber, the hands that piece our work together, celebrating Texture is fundamental to achieving this. Oops. Wrong. So for us, tactility and mixing raw materials in old ways with new design is very much a characteristic of our work. We use mohair specifically directly from our farm, which we hand wash, sun dry, and then hand spin into a yarn. And we can talk about raw materials and hand spinning for the longest time. But what I do want to say is when you're working with a natural raw fiber that has never once left its point of origin, been mixed with anything else, or lost its natural character, it gives our work this incredible sense of rawness and because of this, every section of yarn or final fabric is impossible to replicate because ultimately it captures the heat, the hands, the curl, and ultimately the composition of that moment. And then because we mix raw materials with hand spinning, we combine this rawness with the personality of the spinner. And in our studio, we can see who has spun what yarn and 
if you think of all of us, every moment you're thinking something. So whether the spinner is happy or sad or tired or in love or angry, all of those things are caught in the rhythm in which they feed the yarn into the spinning wheel. Um, what we have seen is that in a time of heightened technology, there's been a reverse pullback towards handmade artisanal pieces because there's a certain amount of soul and comfort that we as users can feel from handmade pieces, which is really one of the only things that mass-produced mechanized objects could never give us. So we hope that our principles and philosophies form part of this ripple effect of change, a movement back to nature and agriculture and ancient knowledge banks, making without wasting, foraging your threads, and really starting to create pieces which capture this collective feeling of home, that which is soft, simple, familiar, and safe. To finish off and explain this farm to fabric process, I'm gonna talk about these desert mindscape tapestries. These tapestries are made from mohair from a specific aged animal and a specific region in South Africa, or Lesotho. And we've kept the mohair completely raw and then hand spun it and hand woven it. And why we have done this is to show if you make in this way, the natural environment informs the final feel, function, and outcome of a fabric. So when you use kid mohair, it's like a baby goat, it's the same as humans, the first time we have a haircut. That hair is super delicate and beautiful and should be used for apparel on your skin. Every time a goat has a haircut, the hair changes quality. It's the same as us, when we get older, our hair goes stronger and coarser, depending on the vegetation or animal husbandry, if they're living in Lesotho or the Cape or the Karoo. Our diet, if we're in a humid environment, it affects our hair, it affects the coloring. So this is a way to show how nature, ultimately, if you make like this, informs the fabric. Once it's woven, I then design or sketch my interpretation of the Karoo, whether it is the desert architecture, a kraal, or the walkways of animals, or seed banks, and then artisans will be using their needle and thread to find their way and ultimately express these mind meanderings. And these panels for me really become the reflection of the feelings of women stitching their way through their day and escaping into making as a way of seeing their inner thoughts appear on the canvas of fabric. And for me, this is the true value chain of our textiles in that often only the designer or the artist is celebrated. But here, the, the role of rain, plant, herdsman, sharer, spinner, weaver, designer, and maker, each one carries as much weight, and they really couldn't exist without the other. And to end, I, like for me, in why we do this and, and why we make, um, these panels for me are the homes of souls. They're the fibers of animals, they're the crunch of a desert plant for breakfast. It's the openness to imagine the vastness of the unknown and the joy that we can find in the simple in and out motion of darning our realities into these raw, nonsensical textile roadmaps of where we have come from and how we wish to tread into tomorrow. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Francis, yeah, you are mesmerizing. Just such a natural storyteller. I'm like so moved by your story. You took me back to childhood, you know, thinking of those times where I was connected with nature. And I was thinking of Diniko's um, journey this morning. We were speaking about in the Uber. Just, she's going to speak later, so I'm going to let her <laughs> dive into that. But thank you so much. That was so special. Really appreciate it. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs>